Uh, very good morning once again. I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters at Zion Bishan. Uh, we very much care and our great privilege to be part of a wider Presbytery with you. Uh, our bond uh, as fellow BP churches uh, is very dear to us. And so it's a joy to be here with you and we pray. We pray for you often uh, as a fellow BP church. Uh, well, the saints at Zion Vishan, well, we've been making our way through the book of Revelation. In fact, last Sunday, we preached our last message, our last sermon in the book of Revelation. We've been in this book since August, 26 sermons uh, we spent in the book of Revelation. Uh, and as I was thinking about what to preach from uh, at Herald this morning, I thought what we've seen in uh, John's revelation to the seven churches uh, is, too, is too good not to share with you. Uh, this morning, so I, I, I picked Revelation. And as I was deciding which passage to preach from, I thought, of course, it has to be the passage with the dragon and the beast and the mark of the beast and the number 666. I mean, why not? What could possibly go wrong? In the last 2,000 years of church history, there's literally been thousands of interpretations of this passage. Uh, and so, of course, this is the most interesting passage in Revelation. I'm sure you've heard of it. But seriously, I chose this passage because these are the words of Jesus given to John for those first century churches. And the more we've studied and listened to God speak through the book of Revelation, the more we've realized that every follower of Jesus needs these words. I need these words and you need these words too. And so that's why I decided uh, to preach from this passage today. It's a hard passage, so uh, let's... Uh, pause for a moment, ask for God's help. But I'm also very aware that today is Pentecost. Do you know that? So blessed Pentecost to you. It's not a tradition of our BP churches to celebrate Pentecost usually, but it is a very important uh, day in the church calendar. And it's very important in Revelation because at the end of Revelation, uh, John will say, the spirit and the bride, that's the church, we say, come Lord Jesus, come. In other words, these words here that we have in front of us, they were given by the power of the spirit. To the church. God's word is given by his spirit and so why don't we pause for a moment now to ask for God's help as we listen to him speak. Let's pray. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we ask now that you will powerfully work in our hearts this morning. Please Lord, help us hear and help us keep the words of your son Jesus, the one who holds us, his church, in his hands. Please send your spirit now to do a work in us that we, our lives, our lives might be shaped by your living word. In Jesus' name and for his name's sake we pray. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, come back with me now to 1941. 1941 to the 7th of December, a date which lives now in infamy. I'm referring to the day that Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The aerial attack on the naval base at Pearl Harbor, it began at 7.38 a.m. that Sunday morning. And within just 90 minutes, 90, 90 minutes, more than 2,400 men and women had lost their lives and at least another thousand were wounded. 18 American ships were sunk that day, including five massive, powerful battleships. How was America so tragically and utterly decisively defeated that day. You know, most of us think that Pearl Harbor happened because the US was caught by surprise when the Japanese attacked. And most of us think that actually. But in actual fact, earlier in 1941, before the attack on Pearl Harbor, you know, more than 50% of Americans stated in a survey that they believed that war with Japan was inevitable. In other words, the real problem at Pearl Harbor it uh, wasn't that the U.S. didn't know that, the J that Japan would attack them. They just did not know how Japan would attack them. They didn't know their enemy. The American military leadership, they weren't familiar with the tactics nor the boldness of Japanese, the Japanese military. They knew that Jap Japan was their enemy. They just did not know the way that their enemy fought. Now, in case you think Pearl Harbor isn't quite relevant to us today in Singapore, Every year on the 15th of February, uh, what do we commemorate here in Singapore? Anybody know? 
So as the sirens of our public warning system sound, every year at 6.20 p.m. exactly, what are we commemorating? Total Defence Day. Why 6.20 p.m.? Because that's the exact time on the 15th of February that uh, the British surrendered Singapore 82 years ago. When the British surrendered Singapore to the exact same enemy who defeated the Americans at Pearl Harbor, because of the exact same reason, the largest defeat in the history of the British Empire, 80,000 Allied troops surrendered that day. Well, this largest defeat happened all because the British knew who their enemy was, but they did not know how their enemy would fight. They did not know that, the, that Japan would attack so quickly from the north, that would come through Thailand and then Malaysia. Again, our own national history tells us how important it is to not only know who our enemy is, but to know the way our enemy fights. You know, those of us who were paying attention just now, as the Word of God was read out to us, uh, you will know why all there's this all talk about war and knowing our enemy. You'll know why this matters to us. We just heard it from chapter 12, verse 17. Look with me at that verse in your Bibles. If you haven't opened them, why don't you turn them to me? Chapter 12, verse 17 in Revelation. Then the dragon became furious with the woman, and he went off to make war on the offspring of her, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Friends, if you are someone who calls yourself a follower of Jesus today, who holds to the testimony of Jesus, guess what? This passage, this verse, is talking about us. You are at war. The dragon in this passage in this, is making war on us. Did you think about that this morning as you woke up, got out of bed and prepared to come to church today? Did you wake up thinking you were at war? Well, you are. And we know exactly who this dragon is, don't we? Our enemy, Satan, the devil, the accuser, the evil one. Make no mistake, our enemy in this war, he is great. He is powerful. Don't underestimate him. So we cannot be complacent as he makes war against us. Uh, you know, when it comes to warfare of any kind today, uh, one of the most quoted parts, uh, you know, people find Sun Tzu very helpful. You know Sun Tzu? Have you heard of him? His very famous, well-known book, The Art of War. Uh, in his book, he goes, uh, If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Uh, Sun Tzu's point is two things are necessary, necessary when you're at war. Know yourself and know your enemy. Today's passage is all about war and about knowing our enemy. His strategy, his tactics, how he conducts his warfare against us. And, we know, and as we know our enemy and his tactics, I hope we're going to know ourselves better too. Well, before we look at the specific tactics of our enemy, a quick skim through our passage in Revelation 13 and 14 will help us to spot what the dragon's big objective in this war is. You know what the dragon is trying to, trying to achieve? Well, it's repeated again and again and again in these two chapters. 13 verse 4, and they worship the dragon. 13 verse 8, and all who dwell on it will worship it. Verse 12, and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Verse 15, those who will not worship, 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 worship. What is the devil's big objective? What's this war for? Well, it's a war for our worship. He's trying to win our worship. The devil is fighting for the hearts and the minds of every single person on this planet and every person in this room. Every single move that the evil one makes, every single tactic and strategy is designed to one end. He wants our worship. Now to be very clear, when he says he wants our worship, we're not just talking about the one and a half hours, two hours that we gather together on a Sunday morning. No, this worship here is the Romans 12 verse 1 definition of worship. He's after the worship of our lives. The holy and acceptable to God worship that is all of our living, our thinking, uh, our, our striving for in this world. The devil is trying to win worship in every single area of our life. We just heard that the devil was defeated in the heavenly places. He was thrown down. He lost the war for worship in heaven. And so he was powerless to prevent the birth, the ascension, the enthronement of King Jesus. 
and the angels and the living creatures and the elders in heaven in, in, in Revelation, they are all rightfully worshipping God and His land now in the heavenly places. So what would you do if you're the devil? Well, you'll war for worship in the only place you can, on earth and the sea, the territory where he hasn't yet been defeated. And so this is how he conducts his war here on earth. As a dragon stands on the sand, the place in between land and sea, here's how he wages war against us. He calls out two beasts to wage his war. You know, now we as the VP tradition, the denomination, we have traditionally advocated a literal reading of the Bible, which I believe is generally a good starting point. But when it comes to Revelation, surely these beasts here, many things can't be read strictly literally, right? Uh, such as the devil calling beast to wage his war. You know, this isn't a scene out of Godzilla or Pacific Rim. You know, the end times are giant monsters coming out of the sea. You know, that's not really what's going to happen, is it? No, remember that these two beasts are the evil one's way to gain our worship. In other words, they represent the devil's method, his strategies for winning this world's war. So firstly, let's have a look at the first beast. Strategy number one. John sees this first beast that the dragon calls out from the sea in verse 1. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw, it was like a leopard, and his feet was like a bear's, his mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Let me point out a few things about beast number one. Firstly, Notice straight away the direct connection between the beast and its master, the great red dragon. They both have seven heads, ten horns, and diadems or crowns on their heads. This beast, like its master, is all about authority and power. Verse 2 makes that very clear as the dragon gives his power and throne and great authority to this first beast. Secondly, this beast looks like some strange combination of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Do you see it? Uh, here's one of the lessons we've learned at Zion Vishan as we've been learning to read Revelation well. The stranger the image in Revelation, the more we need to look back to the Old Testament. The stranger the image, the more we need to look back to the Old Testament to really understand it, to really make sense of it. And all these visions that God shows the Apostle John, they're not randomly plucked out of thin air, they're made up. No, they're building on what God has already said in the Old Testament. He's been really revealing this from the beginning. And this very strange looking mutant beast is no exception. The exact place in the Old Testament that we should go to is Daniel chapter 7, which is also a vision shown to Daniel. Daniel's vision is all about beasts, four great beasts to be precise. And the first three of Daniel's four beasts in chapter, Daniel chapter 7, guess what? They look like a lion and a bear and a leopard. Does that sound familiar? But it is the fourth beast that Daniel sees greater than the three that came before it. Well, this fourth beast in particular has got Daniel really concerned and worried. He's so anxious about this fourth beast that he asks, what do they represent? And here's what Daniel is told in Daniel chapter 7 verse 15 onwards. These four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. These four beasts, they represent kings and kingdoms, empires with great power. Many have made a case that the four beasts in Daniel's vision are the four great empires from Daniel's time to the time that Revelation is written. In other words, it's the Babylonian, the Middle Persian, the Greek, and then finally the Roman Empire. That's the empire that was ruling in John's time. And so the beast from the sea, this first beast that John sees in Revelation 13, is the same as the fourth beast with ten horns in Daniel's vision. The one that has a little bit of the three great empires that came before it. But it is different to the other kingdoms. Look with me a bit more closely at what Daniel is told from verse 23. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth. There shall be different from all the kingdoms before it. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, 
He shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given to his hand for a time, times and half a time. This matches the first beast in Revelation in so many ways. Not only the ten horns, but the first beast in Revelation, remember, it's all about authority. Authority and power. Revelation 13 verse 7 is given authority over every tribe and every people and language and nation. All who dwell on earth will worship it. This revelation beast, he also speaks against God very openly, blatantly uttering haughty and blasphemous words against God, speaking out against the Most High. Both beasts are also allowed to exercise authority for a time, times and half a time. Or as Revelation 13 verse 5 puts it, 42 months. You know what's 42 months? Three and a half years. Time, times and half a time. As we, bo- as we realize that both the Daniel and Revelation beast, they represent empires and authorities here on earth, it's not hard to fit in the rest of the descriptions of this beast with what was happening with the Roman Empire in the late first century. You know when John writes these words, when he's given the vision? Uh, the Roman emperor was someone called Domitian, uh, whose formal title in Latin, we have this recorded down, was Dominus et Deus which is translated as the Lord and God. That was his title in official imperial Roman documents. Surely, this Roman Empire, this Roman Emperor Domitian, he fits the bill of someone who was a blatant blasphemer against God, right? To call himself the Lord and God. Not to mention that he had an imperial cult, which advocated the worship of Domitian as the true God and promised great persecution if you didn't worship him as well. Persecution that sometimes even led to death. That was probably the reason why John was exiled in Patmos when he wrote these words. In fact, we suspect that the original recipients, the people that John is writing to in Revelation, uh, especially in the church in Pergamon, they might have been grieving at that moment the death of one of their brothers, Antipas, who was killed among them. In other words, he was persecuted to death most likely from the imperial cult of Domitian. So read with me from verse 7. Uh, Also, this first beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. And then he quotes Jeremiah 15. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. There are a few interpretations of Jeremiah 15 here. But if you understand the first beast, then you will see that there are only two types of people in this world. Those who worship the beast and therefore worship its master, the dragon, and those who do not. Those whose names are in the book of life. Those who are, even though they are conquered and are slain, they refuse to abandon their right worship. They are faithful witnesses like Antipas. You know, uh, it's here at this point that we need to pause and remember what we're doing here this morning. We're here to understand the way that Satan wages war against us. The first beast, the way, the strategy number one of the dragon, It represents earthly empires and power and authority. This is the strategy that the devil uses uh, to achieve his goal. Wear down the saints. Wear down the saints so much that we'll say, it's too hard. It's too difficult to follow Jesus. It's too costly to be someone who worships the true God with all of our lives. This beast represents all external pressure to abandon your true worship of God and Jesus. You know, this beast, it certainly did not die when Domitian died. It certainly didn't die when the Roman Empire fell apart, right? In the almost 2,000 years since John wrote these words, surely it isn't hard to name empires that have come and gone, where there are blatant blasphemy, with kings and rulers who put themselves in the place of the only true God. If not in name, then certainly in practice. You know, even today in the 21st century, It wouldn't take too long to think of some examples of power and authority in this world 
that blatantly puts pressure on you to deny your Christian faith, that openly denies King Jesus, that seeks to supplant him as somebody you should live for. These powers and authorities, they will always persecute those who worship Jesus, sometimes even unto death. Don't we see that happening very clearly in some of our brothers and sisters around the world today, where they live with empires and authorities, where they will lose their life if they worship King Jesus. But we're here in Singapore. We don't experience that kind of blatant persecution, right? Uh, if we think hard about it, uh, aren't there hints of the rule of this beast all around us, even in Singapore? Every time there's power, not just nationally, but in your office place, your schools, uh, your family maybe, when they put pressure on you and make it hard to be a Christian. Every time you feel the urge to keep the fact that you're a Jesus follower hidden. I mean, if you were too blatantly Christian in some circles, uh, wouldn't you be at some kind of disadvantage? Whether you will be left out socially or even passively mocked for being a serious Christian. You know, sometimes when you tell people you're Christian, they're like, oh, you're so poor thing, you know. You live in this, you believe this fairy tale. And sometimes you get that reaction. Whether you're pressured to conform to a certain cultural values or practices and maybe even punished a bit. Maybe in your career progression. Uh, maybe in uh, not conforming to the ways of the world in some way. Isn't this first beast still present and actively working all around us today? And so the response to the first beast of power and authority is what? It's a call for endurance. It's a call for endurance and the faith of the saints. This is a call for your endurance this morning, for your faith, for your right and proper worship of God and His Lamb. Will you endure and conquer or will you succumb to the pressure of the first beast and the devil? Choose to go with the flow. Take the easier way of the world. Outright persecution, blatant blasphemy, open rebellion against the Creator God. You know the evil one would have us think that this is the only strategy that he's using against us. But how many beasts are there in today's passage? There are two. Uh, there's a second beast in today's vision from verse 11. Uh, then I saw... Another beast rising out of the earth, it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives all who dwell on earth telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. You know, notice the second beast. He's completely in league with the first beast. His goal, the second goal of this beast, is exactly the same as the first. To draw away worship from God uh, and worship the first beast and the dragon. This second beast is definitely on team dragon. But even though its objective is the same, it achieves the same objective in a completely different way. This is the second strategy of the dragon to win our worship. The first beast was all about outward, blatant pressure, right, to conform. Well, this second beast, he's much more subtle. A quick glance at the first beast, and you can see, right, you can see it, seven horns and ten horns, it will, seven heads and ten horns. It will immediately tells you who it looks like. But look at how this second beast is described. It has two horns like a lamb. Who is the lamb in Revelation? It's Jesus. This second beast looks a bit like Jesus. Not only that, it performs signs like God's prophets of old, like Elijah calling down fire on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal. This second beast, at first glance, looks like the real deal. Looks like somebody who you should follow if you're a Jesus follower. But it's only when you listen carefully to his voice do you detect the dragon's voice behind it. You know, the second beast later on in Revelation is called the false prophet. The false prophet. And what a deceptive false prophet is. You know how deceptive and subtle this beast is? Look at verse 15. It was allowed to give breath to the image 
so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause all those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. This second beast, he is so subtle, he is so nuanced, that it doesn't get you to worship the first beast directly. He gets you to worship the image of the first beast. And you can tell how cunning and deceptive this beast number two is when you look at all who fall prey to this beast. Look at verse 16. It causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand of the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, everyone. Everyone is susceptible, is in danger of the deceitful ways of this second beast. And so, of course, the call for John's reader changes from endurance with the first beast. What's the call for the second beast? Wisdom. Wisdom to discern. Let the one who understands, calculates the number of beasts, understand this beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is 666. Uh, now, I'm very aware that this verse is probably the most well-known verse in Revelation 13, 666. I'm not joking when I say that tens of thousands of hours have been spent speculating who this second beast is, what his mark is. Entire websites, if you do a Google search, entire websites are de dedicated to calculating the number of this second beast, 666. Some people have spent their whole lives trying to figure out what the number means. If you don't believe me, I try asking ChatGBT what 666 means. ChatGBT, you know what this AI came up with? This is the answer that ChatGBT gave me. The number 666 in Revelation 13 has been subject to various interpretations, including representing a person, an organization, or a concept that embodies evil and opposes God. The meaning is highly debated and has sparked many theories throughout history. In other words, ChatGPT has no idea what number 666 means. You know how ChatGPT works, right? You know how powerful this AI is, right? It, 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 it gathers everything, all the knowledge, right? It pulls all the different articles and insights from the, from the internet to try and present a coherent answer. But uh, here's the thing. ChatGPT can't give an answer for the number, number 666. That's how many different theories there are. So if your ears perked up just now when you heard 666 and you were hoping for a definitive answer, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't have an answer for you. But here's a fact that I found very helpful when you think about the number 666. 666 is not 777. 7 is the number of perfection and completion in Revelation. In other words, the dragon and this second beast, you know, they look like it. They almost get there. It's almost complete and perfect, but it ultimately falls short. This second beast, this second strategy of the devil to win our worship, it will look like a good thing at first, first glance. But make no mistake, it is working to draw away your right worship of Jesus and God. The call for wisdom and discernment here isn't some complex mathematical wisdom. You don't need a PhD in mathematics to figure out what's going on here. It's wisdom to see that the dragon, true beast number two, is seducing us, deceiving us, subtly drawing our worship away from King Jesus. You know, this second beast is the one that I think we really need to know in comfortable, relatively comfortable, prosperous Singapore, don't we? We need to be especially cautious about this second beast. His mark on the right hand, on the forehead, whatever it is, it cannot be something as obvious as a microchip being implanted in you. If it was so obvious, it wouldn't be the second beast. If you think you know exactly how the devil is deceiving you, guess what? He's probably deceiving you some way that you don't know. I think the mark is actually what's going on in your heart. Something that requires much wisdom to discern. To examine if there's anything in your life that the devil is using to draw away your heart from Jesus. And yes, so often when one follows Jesus, there will be economic cost. That's why you can't buy and sell without it. You know, this whole world that revolves around buying and selling. Worshipping Jesus, guess what? It's going to cost you in many ways, but it's going to cost your wallet as well. And so we are called to wisdom today. And so what are the ways 
in your life that the second beast is cunningly working to draw your worship away from King Jesus. And you know, as we draw to a close, uh, this passage is all about knowing how the dragon wages war. And I hope you see the two beasts represent outright persecution, blatant. Some of us have experienced that kind of strategy in our lives. But I'm very sure that the devil is working through that second beast today. What have you spent time on this week that has drawn your thoughts, your concerns, your worries, your life away from the kingdom's pursuit, from King Jesus and the fact that he is coming again? Have you thought about that this week? Or have you been busy thinking about other things in your life? That's the second beast. It's exactly like Daniel. You know, it's not just one or the other. You know, Daniel back in the Babylonian days, what was the Babylon's strategy to draw Daniel away? Well, it's sure, give them good food, feed them, indoctrinate them with Babylonian ways, but it's also outright persecution, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what were they faced with? What was Daniel faced with when he wouldn't worship the statue? Outright persecution, the fiery furnace. They go together, but they're the two strategies of the dragon. And that's how it was with John and the first century believers. Yes, there was outright persecution from Domitian and the imperial cult, but there's also the lures of Rome, the prosperity, the values, buy into Rome. And so it's no different to us today. The dragon is still waging war against the saints of Jesus. Remember the devil's success factor in this war. He wins when you don't worship the right person. In other words, he doesn't need you to set up an altar or a pentagram, <laughs> pentagram in your house and start worshipping the devil, doing satanic rituals. That's not, that's not what he, he wants. As long as you are not worshipping the right king, the devil wins. As long as you're not worshipping King Jesus with all of your life, the devil wins. The devil hates it when God is worshipped rightly. From the very beginning of creation, he hates it. He's trying to draw away from Adam and Eve, draw away their worship, break their relationship with God. And so today, as we look at this passage with all the imagery and the beast, the question we should be asking is clear. Who are we worshipping today? Who are you worshipping today? Brothers and sisters, please heed Jesus' call for endurance and faith and for wisdom today. Make no mistake, if you don't heed these calls and take them seriously this morning, as fatal as not knowing your enemy is in a physical war is, do you realize that being defeated in this war for worship is much, much worse? It has far greater consequences. It means our book, our names are removed from the book of life. If we fail to endure and to keep faith, we will lose our place in the eternal new creation. Serious stuff. Please heed Jesus' call. Consequences are far, far greater than any other war we could be in. As we enter into a time of self-reflection, it's a lot of wisdom to know the ways that we are buying in. Uh, the, saints, uh, the saints are being tempted away from worship. Can I point out that it's not just an individual exercise? Uh, in Revelation, it's all about the saints together the churches together worshipping rightly. And so that's why you and I are here together this morning. We have each other in this corporate body, in this war, to speak truth to one another, to lovingly call ourselves out of this world. Your spouses, will you have a conversation with them tonight? What way do you think our family is being deceived? What way do you think we're worshipping? We're not rightfully worshipping King Jesus. The corporate body, your care groups. Isn't that such a great uh, reason why we should have care groups to love one another and to call ourselves out from this world? Uh, Harold BP Church as a church family. The BPCS as a wider BP denomination. We stand together in this world, brothers and sisters. Uh, I hope you hear the call of Jesus. Will you choose today to worship the Lamb and to win this war of worship? Let me close this in prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, 
as the dragon wages war on us, we remember the situation. We remember that he has already been thrown down and defeated. But because of that, he's becoming more and more desperate to wage war against us, your saints. And so we, will, we pray that we will not forget the way that he is waging war against us. We will, forget, we will not forget what you have said to us today. And we pray that we will fix our eyes on the Lamb who was slain for us to help us to guard our worship well. Keep feeding our hearts with the gospel of King Jesus that we might love worshipping you and your son so much that all the devil's tactics will not draw us away. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.